Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about all the books I read in the first half of the month of October. I have read six books so far in the month of October and if you have been watching my weekly vlogs you will have seen me talk about all of these books in depth and my thoughts and feelings but I did want to also do the formal wrap-up content in case there are viewers who don't prefer vlogs and who would like to consume this type of content in this format. So this is for you if that is your preference but again if you have been watching my vlogs you will have already seen all of these books wrapped up. For the month of October I did decide to participate in Bookopolathon. This technically did take place in September but since I've only just now returned to book two and I wanted to do something fun for October I decided to go ahead and push Bookopolathon to this month. So as we go through the reads I will try to remember to tell you the prompts that they satisfied and so on. The very first book that I read in the month of October was You by Caroline Kepnes and this satisfied the prompt to read a Becca Wreck. You is a fairly well-beloved book here on booktube. It follows our main character Joe Goldberg who is a bookstore manager and one day he is working and a woman who we come to learn is Guinevere Beck walks in and Joe is instantly fascinated. He's basically instantly in love with Guinevere or as we come to know her as Beck and so because of this Joe decides that he is going to stalk her and insinuate himself into her life basically and so we're following him as he begins the stalking process you know standing outside of our apartment and looking in and then eventually striking up an actual relationship with her and you're watching the development of this you're seeing him watching her in her private moments you're seeing as they are actually communicating communicating and speaking with each other. You're seeing him as he is basically spying on all of the communications that she's having virtually because he has access to her text messages and her emails. The unique thing about this book is that it is told in second person. So you are in Joe's mind and he is basically speaking to you as the reader as if you are Beck. So he'll say you did this, you did this, you did this. So it is definitely a very interesting and unique reading experience. I was hesitant to read the book for that reason because I had a feeling that this narration style would lend to a disconnect because you are completely in Joe's head and he is speaking to you as the reader as though you are Beck it definitely doesn't lend itself for you to connect with any of the other characters in the book aside from Joe but I will say that I found the writing style very engaging very unique you definitely become absorbed in Joe's thoughts and how he's thinking and feeling and if you do have the opportunity to listen to this via audiobook I would highly recommend because I felt like the narrator did a fantastic job of basically becoming coming Joe. He had a lot of emphasis and emotion in when he was reading and so it almost made you feel like you were listening to Joe narrate his own thoughts which was really cool. But overall unfortunately this book just didn't work for me. First of all I really disliked Beck as a character. I thought she was manipulative, she was a liar, she was two-faced, she kept secrets, hid a lot of things. She basically liked to play around with guys and once she had them she didn't want them anymore and I had a really hard time understanding why Joe was so obsessed with Beck, like what it was about her that made him focus on her and not some other type of girl, especially as he was able to see all of the secrets that she was keeping from him because he had access to all of her communications. I also felt like this was a little bit too overdone in the sexualizing situations. For example, because you were in Joe's mind, you're constantly hearing about all the dirty things that he wants to do to Beck, when he wants to do them, where, with his tongue, with, with basically every part of his body. And if he's not thinking about it, he's basically watch her pleasure herself in the privacy of her own home. So I just felt like that was a little bit too much especially for a book that isn't really a romance it doesn't really feel sexy or anything like that because you are watching Joe who is this very disturbed kind of person thinking all of these thoughts so it really just felt dirty and perverted rather than anything else. So overall I didn't love this. I definitely will not be continuing in the series. I have watched the first episode or two of the Netflix series and I may continue with that. I am not entirely sure. I definitely think so far it is holding my attention better and I'm connecting more to the show than I did to the book. So this could just be one of those abnormal situations where the books are not for me but the adaptation is. I know that that's a really unpopular opinion. Like I said, you as a pretty beloved book here, but it just wasn't for me. The next book I read was The Magnolia Palace by Fiona Davis. This satisfied the prompt to read a book based on a random emoji generator. So I used a random emoji generator 
to generate an emoji which I got a key and then I had to pick a book that kind of reminded me of that emoji and so I decided to go ahead and pick this because key palace they just kind of went together in my mind. This is a historical fiction set in two different timelines. The first timeline is 1919 and you're following our main character Lillian Carter. She is very young. She's in her early 20s and up until this point she has been a very successful artist's model. So her likeness is depicted in statuary all over the city of New York but her mother has recently passed away and so she is now having a very hard time coping. She is not getting as many model gigs as she used to. She is gaining weight and she is just very down on her luck. And then things get worse one day when her volatile landlord who she has constantly heard fighting with his wife actually kills his wife. But then Lillian somehow ends up wrapped up in the investigation because the police think that she was somehow involved. And so she flees. She gets the hell out of Dodge and she ends up randomly becoming the private secretary to Helen Frick. Helen Frick is the daughter of Henry Clay Frick and they are the owners of this very elaborate mansion in New York. And this mansion is filled with extravagance especially with regard to art and in fact it is Henry's wish that after he passes away that his mansion is turned into a museum. So you're following Lillian as she stumbles upon this job accidentally and so she's getting to know the family, she's getting to know the secrets they keep and everything that goes along with being the private secretary in this type of situation. The second timeline is set in 1966 and of course now the Magnolia Palace is actually the museum that Henry Clay Frick wanted it to be and you're following a different model. Her name is Veronica and she is currently at the museum attending a photo shoot but something happens during the photo shoot and she is kind of embarrassed and ostracized and so she goes and hides away in the mansion in one of the rooms and she ends up discovering a stash of these secret letters hidden away that nobody has found prior to this and she discovers that it's a kind of scavenger hunt of sorts and there are clues and everything and she gets so absorbed in reading the clues but she doesn't actually hear when everybody leaves and so she finds herself locked in the museum and there's actually a pretty heavy blizzard outside. She that she's actually locked in with one of the archivists that works at the palace and he is locked in too because he is only part-time. He does not have a key. So they are kind of stuck there and of course the blizzard is causing complications. The power is out and they can't call for help or anything of that nature and so they actually decide to partake in the scavenger hunt based on the clues and it goes from there. Overall this was just fine. I was wanting a little bit more out of it. I thought it was disproportionate how much the 1919 got featured in comparison to the 1966 timeline. I also felt that for the most part, not a whole heck of a lot happened in this book. It was very slow going. There wasn't even much involved with the scavenger hunt. I felt like it was going to be a little bit more adventurous, a little bit more mysterious and suspenseful, and it just wasn't. The 1919 timeline really was just about Lillian becoming a private secretary and the minutia of that day and learning about the family and all of that comes with being in that position. And then in 1966, you're just following these two people who are locked in the museum doing the scavenger hunt. So overall I found it very underwhelming, a little bit boring, and then near the end of it I actually felt like it wrapped up too neatly. I don't really want to say too much but things that had been left resolved in 1919 come to a head in 1966 and I felt like it was all wrapped up in a very neat little bow. Considering 50 years had passed between 1919 and 1966 it was just a little bit too clean in my opinion. I don't know there was just something about the ending that didn't really work for me. Overall like I said very lackluster. Didn't really do a whole lot for me. I ended up giving this a three stars and I'm probably going to put it up on Pingo Books. Oh, also, I don't know if I actually gave the rating for you by Caroline Kepnes, but I gave that a three stars as well. Next, I read Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. I was really excited to get to this because I absolutely adored the love hypothesis, and so I definitely wanted to read more of her women in STEM novels. So this book is following our main character, B, and she is a very successful neuroscientist working for the National Institute of Health, and she is being sent to Houston to collaborate on a project with NASA that concerns helmets and astronauts. But she is sent there and she is dismayed to find out that the person leading the project for NASA is her old college nemesis Levi. She is convinced that Levi hates her based on everything that happened in college and how he looked at her and how she was perceived by him and so she is very unsettled by working with Levi. But things start to go wrong in the lab. For example her equipment was supposed to have arrived by the time they got there and it is not there and other things are happening and Levi kind of steps in and becomes her savior and they end up striking a solid partnership especially when they kind of find out that it is possible that the project might be on the line. So they step up and really champion the project and start working together to make progress on it and 
it kind of goes from there. Unfortunately, I just didn't find this to be as top tier of a romance as the love hypothesis was. I had a lot of technical issues with the story. First, I felt like this could be very heavy handed with the social commentary. Now, obviously, this is a woman in STEM novel, and so there definitely has to be some mention of the misogyny and sexism that occurs in this field and how historically difficult it has been for women in this field, and I completely understand that. But at points, I felt like it could have been toned down just a little bit because there was social commentary on more than just that. And so at some point, I thought that I was listening to the author using the characters to spout her own opinions. I also felt that B was comically dense to the point of it being unbelievable. She is convinced based on her experience with Levi in grad school, that he hates her and nothing will convince her otherwise. Even when he outright tells her that he never hated her and never saw her that way, she refuses to believe that. And even when they start striking up something more akin to like a friends with benefits situation leading into a romance, she still does not see it. So she refuses to believe what is directly in front of her, even when Levi is directly telling her and hinting at what he feels for her, she does not see it. So Allie Hazelwood was really, really magnifying that trope along with the trope of miscommunication that was definitely used in here as well to further the plot. And I really don't like that. I really don't like when miscommunication is one of the main things that's keeping the main characters apart. There was also a side plot in here that I really wasn't sure why it was in here. It definitely didn't add anything to the overall story. It didn't do much for it at all. I don't know. It just felt all very unnecessary. It did not need to be included because it didn't add anything to the story. So overall, this was absolutely not the top tier that I was expecting, especially after reading The Love Hypothesis. So unfortunately, I only gave this a 3.5 stars. It wasn't quite meh enough to be a three star, but it definitely wasn't strong enough to be a four star. This was just not what I wanted it to be. I really did love the characters of B and Levi. I thought that B was very, very quirky. I love the fact that she was a vegan. I am a vegan and I don't see that representation very often in books. Levi was a vegan as well. So there was a lot of really strong aspects to these characters and their dynamic and the work that they were doing. And this had so much more potential, but just the tropes and the predictability and that stupid little side plot that didn't need to be here, all of that just really worked against this book in my opinion and didn't work for me. So 3.5 stars. Next, I read All Good People Here by Ashley Flowers. Ashley Flowers is the podcast host of a very popular true crime podcast called True Crime Junkie and this is her debut novel. It is set in two different timelines. In the present timeline you are following Margot and Margot is a reporter and she is having to move back to her hometown to care for her ailing uncle who is sick. I believe he has some type of early onset dementia or Alzheimer's. He is losing his memory and he's not able to really survive well on his own and so because he basically helped raise her and she has a close relationship with him, she is going to move back home and care for him. Now, Margot and the town itself has kind of been haunted for the past 25 years by the death of January Jacobs, who was Margot's friend. They were both just six years old at the time when January was killed. And no one was ever able to solve what happened to her, but there was heavy suspicion on the family, particularly the mother. No arrests were ever made and it was kind of just left unsolved, but definitely has left a mark on the town. And so when Margot arrives, she is shocked to find that another young girl named Natalie has also gone missing and she believes that there is a connection to this missing girl with the death of January and she is determined to find out what that is and so she begins investigating the crime. There is also another timeline in this book. It is set in 1994 when January is killed and the perspective is from January's mother Chrissy and so you're following the events of what happened immediately after January's death and then how the two timelines kind of connect together. As a debut novel I felt like this was a very solid attempt. I didn't really have any issues with Ashley Flowers' writing style whatsoever. I was pretty engaged with the story and intrigued throughout. I felt like there was a nice pace, a nice atmosphere, and overall it was just a solid well done attempt at a mystery thriller. I will say that I felt overall it was a little bit basic just in terms of its complexity. She did definitely throw some red herrings out there. She took you down these dead end paths to follow. So she was trying to send you in these different directions to throw you off of the path. I will say that some of it did feel very predictable. Nothing was necessarily shocking. Overall, I was okay with what she did with the story and where she went with it. The ending probably will get a lot of people because there wasn't closure. If you've read Sadie, it kind of reminded me a little bit 
of the ending with Sadie. It definitely has a lot of nods to the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case. If you are familiar with that case, I'm sure everybody is. It's probably one of the biggest mysteries in the United States of all time. Who killed Jean Bonnet Ramsey? She was just a six year old beauty queen who was found dead in her home. And there are so many different theories out there about what happened to that little girl. And then you can kind of tell that Ashley Flowers took a lot of inspiration from that. I've read this book called Jean Bonnet Fan Fiction. So there's that. I would say my overall complaint with the story is that kind of going along with the basicness of it is that there wasn't necessarily any conflict or resistance to Margot's investigation. I feel like she was able to get the answers that she needed pretty easily in her investigation. There wasn't a lot of no, I don't want to talk to you or things like that. People just seemed to open up and give her what she wanted, which was very unbelievable and also added to the lack of substance that I felt like this book had. So again, overall, I'm pretty happy with my experience with this book and definitely stronger than some of the other mystery thrillers that I've read by even experienced authors. So I'm not discounting Ashley Flowers at all and looking forward to reading what she puts out next. I feel like she has a lot of potential and she's only going to get better as she continues to write. So I gave this one a 3.5 out of 5 stars. All good people here satisfied the prompt to read a book with buildings on the cover. Next, to satisfy the prompt of reading a book that features a romance, I decided to read Betrayed by Emily Henry. This is another book that is very much beloved here on booktube. I hear almost nothing but great things about this book, so I was excited to jump into it. This is following our main character, January Andrews. It is told entirely from her perspective, and at the beginning of this book, she is coping with some family trauma. Her dad has passed away, and after he passed away, she found out some disturbing secrets that he had been keeping that she knew absolutely nothing about. And she is struggling because she is a successful writer of rom-coms. And after everything that she's learned about her dad, she no longer really believes in the happy ending. She is very disillusioned. So she is suffering intensely from writer's block. And in an effort to help her with her writer's block, she decides to go live at this lake house I believe it's in Michigan. It is a house that her dad owned and grew up in. And so she's going there to try to deal with her writer's block as well as also get the house ready for selling. So she gets there and then much to her dismay, she discovers that she is neighbors with Augustus Everett. Now, Augustus is an acclaimed writer of literary fiction. And she also kind of considers him her nemesis just because they did go to college together. She got the distinct impression that he did not like her based on the way he treated her. And she also felt like he looked down on her because she was a romance writer, like writing romance was less then but they do both have one thing in common they are both struggling from writer's block and they are both struggling with their own personal issues and so they end up striking up a friendship and they decide to challenge each other january challenges gus to write a rom-com and gus challenges january to write literary fiction and they are both helping each other with the research necessary to write these types of books so you are following them as they're going on these field trips and they're getting to know each other and they're trying to break their writer's block and write their books and then of course it develops into something more. I very much enjoyed this book. I really like Emily Henry's writing and I liked some of the observations that January made about women writing rom-coms and how that is looked upon and how it would be perceived if she was a male writing these books or writing literary fiction. I of course also just love the banter overall. I find that Emily Henry is very clever and witty and that just shines through in this book. I also appreciated the fact that this was a book written about writer's block. You can tell that Emily Henry put a lot of her own like experiences and views on writer's block in this book. So that was a really interesting aspect of that overall, because even though this is about a romance, it is also about being a writer and writer's block and everything that goes into writing a book and everything that it takes out of the authors who write them. So overall, I very much enjoyed this. I gave this a four stars. I don't think I am as head over heels with this book as a lot of people in the booktube community are. But again, it was a very solid romance story. I greatly enjoyed this and I'm definitely going to be reading anything more that Emily Henry writes in the future. The last book that I want to talk to you about today is Blood Sugar by Sasha Rothschild. If I were to summarize this briefly, I would say that it is a character study of a killer, but an abnormal killer. This follows our main character, Ruby. And this isn't a spoiler, by the way. It is basically known from page one. And it is in the book synopsis that Ruby is a killer and she has killed three people over her 30 years of life. She is not necessarily what you would expect of a killer. Like she's a very empathetic and compassionate person. She is actually a therapist helping people through their trauma. She is a huge animal lover. She actually volunteers with animals. She owns animals. And so that's definitely not what you would expect in regards to those standard serial killer stereotypes, you know, of them starting with torturing animals from a young age, that is definitely not her. So she doesn't fit the mold of what you would think a 
killer would be but she has her own rules and standards and she doesn't feel any guilt over the lives that she's taken she feels that the world is better off without these people and so what this really is it is about her from a very young age from the first time she killed up to now and in the present day timeline she's actually being investigated for the death of her husband which is the one death that she did not cause but she is now under suspicion because after the death of her husband the police realized that there were these three other deaths that happened with her in the vicinity and they find that very very unusual so they are investigating her and they are trying to tie her to these three other deaths as well and so as she's being interrogated by the police and going through this in the present day timeline you are then following her from that young age to the present day you are following her decisions why she took the lives that she did what she's gone through in her life the people her decision making her rationale and I found that aspect of this book very very fascinating. I was highly intrigued by the way that this book was told by the unique character of Ruby Simons. I have never read a book that really followed this projection or this type of character before especially one that definitely didn't fit the typical stereotypes that you would expect to see of a serial killer. I don't necessarily feel like serial killer is the proper term for her because it was only three people. It was over many years apart and none of the motives and none of the methods were the same in any of the killings but Ruby was definitely a dynamic and interesting character. I liked being in her head. I liked some of the thoughts and observations that she was having. So it was an enjoyable experience being inside her head for the narration of the book. However, by the end of this book, I found myself asking, what was the point? I don't really want to go into what the ending of it was. I did get a little bit more spoilery in the vlog that is going to be out a few days after this video. So if you are interested, you can check that out. But I felt like the ending was very lackluster. I felt like nothing came of everything that was happening in the present timeline and what we were learning about Ruby in the past. I didn't really feel like it led up to anything. I was left wondering what the author was trying to say, what message I as the reader was supposed to receive. I didn't really understand. And so by the end of it, I was was just kind of left with that's it. After all of this, after getting to know Ruby and her life so well, we're basically left with not a whole lot. So I found that very underwhelming. I don't necessarily know where I wanted this book to go. I don't know what I was expecting, but I know that I was expecting more than that. I was expecting there to be a bigger purpose to the overall story and I just don't feel that there was. And so because of that, I don't know if this book will stick with me like I thought it would, given the fact that I felt like it was very unique. And so I think I'm only going to give this a three stars and I'm really disappointed by that because I was in it from the start of this book. I was in it from page one. If you've read this book and you know what happens on page like the first couple of pages of this book you'll probably know what I mean. Like it goes there from the very first pages of this book. You find out what type of person Ruby was as a child and I was here for it but it just didn't maintain itself throughout the book and so I don't think I could give it a higher rating. My month so far has been overall very meh. I've had three three stars, two 3.5, and one four star and even my four star beach read it wasn't necessarily anything that like blew my mind so I feel very meh about the month so far. I will say that I have mostly finished my October TBR. I only have two more books on it and one I don't know if I'm going to even attempt to read. It's the book to satisfy the prompt over 500 pages. I just don't know if I'm gonna do it y'all. I just don't know if my brain is there in the mood for young adult fantasy so I don't know but I do have to read lessons in chemistry which I'm still very much looking forward to but other than that I am free to kind of read whatever I want for the rest of the month and I'm hoping that my reading month improves and we'll just have to see. All right y'all that is it those are all the books that I've read so far in the month of October. Please let me know if you have read any of these books and what you thought. I know I may have a little bit of unpopular opinions about some of these so I would love to know and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.